Today, Jesus talks about friendship. And our verses for today are John 15, 13 to 16a. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you slaves anymore, because a slave doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So what did he mean when he called his disciples his friends? Did Jesus mean friends like we like to get together over coffee? Or did he mean people you work with? Think of all the things friends might bring to mind. And <laughs> I'd almost be willing to bet that what came to mind wasn't obeying your friend. In fact, if your friend started bossing you around, that friendship would be no more, I think. So what did Jesus mean when he said this? What did the disciples understand about Jesus' use of this word friend? We think we know what a friend is, everybody knows what a friend is, but we don't understand what they knew back in that day. It was a world of powerful kings. They lived in a midst of court intrigue, a world of empires and lethal politics. And this world is utterly foreign to Americans. We were founded on the idea of rebellion against the very idea of kings and kingdoms, so it's out of our heads. The closest we come is the stories of Napoleon, which is, this is a picture of him crowning his girlfriend or princess or something. Or we read King Arthur, that gives us sort of an idea of kings, or some people just love to watch the British monarchy because, I don't know why, <laughs> because we don't understand kings and queens and all this. We might get closer to understanding it if uh, what a friend means if we remember the movies of the Italian mafia as the godfather. Remember this scene? In those movies, what constituted a friend? In that context, of course, nobody trusts anybody. There's no honor in thie among thieves, as we know. So a friend is someone the mafia don can trust. And that friend is trusted only as long as he obeys. And when he disobeys, he is no longer trusted and is no longer a friend and is a dead man. That's the way the Roman world understood friend. Like that in the king's court, there was this inner circle of friends who the king could trust with his life. Maybe like King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. That's what this is a picture of. These friends of the king had free access to him, and they could even come into his bedroom first thing in the morning before his advisors and slaves started the business of the day. They were trusted friends. The king didn't trust his slaves or his advisors because he knew they could be working for the enemy. He didn't tell them anything except what they needed to know to do their jobs, but his friends he told everything. He confided in them. All his plans, they knew. Friends of the king maintained their status by reliable obedience. Friends of the king. That was Roman power. That was their idea of friends. The Greeks had an idea more like our idea of friend. But the two were sort of compatible. Affection for your close buddy was kind of the Greek idea of friend. They understood from their philosophers, in fact, that the highest form of friendship was to sacrifice your life for your friend. So you can see Jesus sort of picks up on that here. So there was, in the cultural air around this time, the idea that true friendship is both obedient and sacrificial and affectionate. All those things wrapped together. The relationship between a master teacher and his disciples, like Jesus and his disciples, 
was kind of the same thing, based on the same pattern. The friendship of the mentor was maintained by the obedience of the disciple. I have a pastor friend, he's trying to mentor somebody, and he says, a mentor's supposed to do, I mean, a, a follower's supposed to do what the mentor tells him to do, because they know that's what's gonna help him prosper, right? And so he's all frustrated. Well, that was the world of Jesus and the disciples. It was a world of Roman power and Greek culture all woven together through Jewish tinted eyeglasses. And we, we think Americans invented pluralism? <laughs> Not a chance. So the disciples' friendship with the Lord wasn't just about loving him. It was about trust based on obedience, and so we can see what a tragedy Judas was even more. He proved not to be a friend. Trust based on obedience even to death. That's what Jesus meant when he said the greatest love is to lay down your life for your friend. You think of soldiers in battle. I think Virgil knows more about this than he wants to know. And perhaps Jay knows something about this fighting fires. You have to, you're in a situation where you have to absolutely trust your buddy or your person even next to you with your life. It's the situation. That's what Jesus is talking about right here. So when Jesus says a true friend is one who will sacrifice him for his friend, he's warning them that's what he's about to do. He, their Lord, intends to sacrifice himself for them and ultimately for the whole world of all creation. And so here in the upper room, having this private conversation, unloading his heart, he's showing that he is their true friend. Although he is their Lord and their master, he's unlike other lords. He's willing to sacrifice himself for them, he's also their dearest friend. John told us that he loved them to the end. So, now we have a more accurate understanding of what friend means in this context, what Jesus was talking about. He is our Lord. Our relationship with him isn't casual or ad hoc somehow just happened to happen. He planned it from the big, before the beginning of creation, he said. Boggles my mind. He planned to be my friend before the beginning of creation. It isn't ad hoc or casual. It isn't even as emotional as I thought it would be. Friendship and love sounds emotional. It's not. The emotion's part of it, but maybe even not the biggest part of it. It appears to include a great deal of continually deciding to be friends and to stay friends. Continually deciding to remain loyal no matter what. Just popped into my head when Joanna and I were going together. We, she lived here and I lived 200 miles away and we met at camp once a year, and we wrote letters. And you know, after two weeks, the feeling of affection kind of goes away. But we decided we want to maintain this relationship. So we, I knew that, regardless of whether I felt anything, I knew that when we got back together again, I would. So it was a process of continually deciding to be friends. And here we are. <laughs> Sometimes we continue to decide to be friends <laughs> and to remain loyal. No matter what. That is the marriage vow, isn't it? Yeah. You decide to seek deeper and deeper affection for Jesus. You decide to love him sacrificially, doing whatever it takes. Deciding to obey him even to the point of dying for Jesus. 
don't even have any idea what that means. Some of the Christians in the Middle East certainly know what that means. Just thinking of those guys on the beach where they got their heads cut. They didn't deny the Lord. That's what it means to be friends of God. That's friends. It was God's idea. It wasn't our idea. So don't worry, you can't mess it up. Isn't that a good word? He knows us inside and out. He remains our friend. He knows what we're going to do anyway. But he expects us to obey his commands, to love God with all your heart and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself. That's what he expects. That was what our responsive reading today was all about. What an awesome thing to be called friends of God. That's what we are, friends of God. We're like Abraham. You know, he was called a friend of God, and so was Moses. Exodus 33, 11 says, The Lord spoke with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. So there in the upper room, Jesus sitting there with his disciples, he calls them friends like his friends Abraham and Moses. <laughs> he will speak to his disciples face to face even when he has gone back to where he came from. And today, he even speaks to us who believe in him and obey him. We're also friends of God, just like his disciples, the disciples all through all the centuries, friends like Abraham and Moses, friends of God. He speaks to us in our inner person. And for some people, he even speaks out loud. You've heard his stories. Now, I have a little problem here. When I say God told me this or that, I often get this, yeah, right. And you hear in the media uh, believers ridiculed when they say something like, that person thinks he's got a direct line to God. We do. <laughs> they just don't understand it. <laughs> yes, we do. Of course, not everything that pops into our mind is a word from God. <laughs> You gotta be, you gotta, don't obey every word that claims to be from God that pops into your head. The Bible tells us to discern the spirits. People will do crazy things, even horrible things, because they think God told them to. That's what these jihadists think, that God told them to do this. So when God tells you to do something, all ethical restraint is removed. You can do anything, because God told you to do it. So be really careful about this. Take some discernment to recognize the voice of God. Generally, he reminds us about the things he's already told us about in the Bible. His voice will be about actions of love and forgiveness and reconciliation and justice and healing. That's God's will for us. His promptings in our hearts feel peaceful happy, joyful, even fun sometimes. Wouldn't it be fun? His voice is not judgmental. His voice is not hateful. His voice will never tell you to do someone else harm. If he needs us to change behaviors, he will enable us to do so. He won't keep banging us over the head to change something we can't change. That's, I don't know who, what voice that is, but it's not God. If he wants you to change something, he'll give you the way to do it, as well as the desire. God's voice is loving, intimate, 
like a close friend, a friend who's closer than your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad. His voice is encouraging and calming. It's peaceful. It's like a still pool of water in a forest clearing reflecting the blue sky and the sparkling sunlight. That's the voice of God. Is it any wonder we love him? I recently heard of a young woman who decided she no longer believed in God. She grew up Christian, good church. One of her friends asked her, so what does it feel like now that you don't believe in God? And she says, well, I do miss having someone to talk to whenever I want to and, and anywhere I am. How could someone with such a deep relationship with God suddenly decide he's not there? She must be kidding herself. Or maybe she's deciding that she was just yammering in her own head to herself. I once tried to imagine that God wasn't there, and it felt so lonely. I couldn't stand it, so it only lasted less than a minute. I couldn't do it. Everything went gray. How do people do it? We really do have an intimate relationship with God. When we choose to believe the fact that Jesus laid down his life for us, that he tore down that thick gray curtain that separates us from God. And now we have access to God anytime, anywhere, about anything at all. We are his friends, his inner circle, like the court of a great king. <laughs> it's quite a big court, billions of believers around the globe and growing. As friends of God, we have the right to talk to God. We call it prayer. And have you noticed how I pray in our prayer time? I don't think about it, but someone once told me that I pray like I'm just talking to somebody. And <laughs> yeah, it's because I am just talking to somebody. <laughs> that's, that's why it sounds that way. I'm not making a prayer. Why would I, why would I try to sound formal? Why would I try to sound holy with deep pastoral tones? Sounding so religious. You've heard pastors, they start intoning their prayers. You know it's not real. At least it doesn't sound like it to me. Just talk to God. That's what I'm doing. That's what prayer is. Can you imagine saying to a friend, Oh, my dear Carol, will you please pass the sugar? You don't talk that way. Why should you talk that way to God? Of course, he is the Lord, so don't try lying to him. Hello, you can't lie to God anyway. But we try sometimes. Maybe we think we're lying to ourselves for that matter. So feel free to talk to God like that yourself. God isn't asking you to make up a prayer like it's a poem or something. People are afraid to pray in public because they think it's it's intimidating. I got to come up with this pretty little poem. Now you're just talking to God. That's all. Just talk to God. He calls us friends, and that's who we are. We're friends of God. Amen. Well, but is this all make believe? Are we just talking to ourselves? like that young woman I was telling you about. Our, is our executive brain just talking to our bodily brain? 
or is our uh, super ego trying to talk our id out of some harebrained scheme? Or maybe some other psychological construct. Is it maybe biology? Is that all it is, just biology, synapses, communicating with chemicals and electrical stimulation? Is that all it is? Are we just talking to ourselves? You know, some people do have this continual conversation going on in their minds all the time. I'm one of those, this yammering going on all the time. But I'm not talking about that. This is quite different. I looked all over the place for a picture that would illustrate the sense and the feeling of what I'm talking about. And Trevor and Anya were the picture that was most appropriate. Look at that little girl. This is quite different. This voice of God in my heart. This, this voice is a sense, a, a feeling, somehow within. We call it our heart, but of course not the organ that pumps blood. We're not talking about that. Let's try an experiment. I want you to go ahead and feel within your inner self right now. Is there within you a quiet, calm joy, some answering warmth in your heart? An encouraging sense, somehow, in your inner person? Who or what is that? You don't have to go, um, and do some thing with your hands. That's the Holy Spirit. That inner warmth is, is the very heart of God within you. It's that Holy Spirit that's making you a friend of God. And sometimes when I feel doubts, the more you learn, the more you doubt. It's crazy. The more you struggle. But when I have that going on in my head, I, I, I feel that inner warmth encouraging me, and I know that it's real. I'm a friend of God. Maybe you don't feel anything. That's all right. Not everybody does. Don't make this a criterion for spirituality, this feeling. Because some people aren't used to being so introspective. Because it is an introspective thing. And sometimes, you know, our bodies are just too loud. Sometimes we're feeling pleasure and enjoying ourselves, and we're not thinking about God. We're not sensing anything about that. And sometimes when you're angry or you're in pain, there's no sense of this presence of God. It's sort of dismaying, actually, but it's, your body is just too loud. You can't hear it. You can't feel it. Sometimes you have guilty feelings that remove the sense from you. Sometimes you've done something you think is wrong. This, you kind of block out this joy thing because you don't feel like you deserve it. Yeah, sometimes it does feel like God has left the building. But he hasn't. You're still like little Anya, there with her dad. Inner feelings really aren't reliable evidence for the presence of God, but I sure love it when I can sense him there. Or perhaps you've never tried talking to God. Maybe you've never asked God to come into your heart. Maybe you sort of believe God existed sometime, but you never noticed whether or not you believe that God, Jesus actually laid down his life for you to open the door to heaven for you so that you can be a friend of God. Maybe you never actually even thought about it. Maybe you've never done this before, but maybe right now you want to ask Jesus to come into your heart like this that I've been talking about. He does it by means of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Comes in. The Holy Spirit is God's very heart, made available through what Jesus did for us. 
God will certainly grant that request. He promised. It's in, it's in Luke 11, 9 through 13. That's what Jesus is talking. He says, I say to you, keep asking. It will be given to you. Keep searching. You will find. Keep knocking. The door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And one who searches finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. <laughs> what father among you, if, if his son asks for a fish, is going to give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, is going to give him a scorpion? So if, if you who are evil know how to good, give good gifts to your children, don't you think your heavenly father will give them to you? He'll give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? Of course he will. You see, Jesus loves you. So go ahead right now and talk to him. Ask Jesus to come into your heart by means of the Holy Spirit. When you do, you have become a friend of God just like Jesus. Just like his disciples. Just like Abraham and Moses, friends of God. And now you can talk to him anywhere, anytime. He's right there with you. He's in you all the time. Now, he will never leave you. Ever. Forever and ever. Even after you die, he's still. Amen.